So yeah, I'm Natan Mish, I'm a machine learning engineer, and today I'm going to talk to you about event-driven machine learning. Um, if you want all the code that I'm going to present here is available on my GitHub, you can uh, follow along, and in the end we'll have a Q&A session. All right, so why should you be interested in event-driven machine learning? So in recent years, has, there has been a paradigm shift in the software development discipline, and I believe it's time to also bring that into the machine learning world. You probably have a machine learning model in production or on its way there, um, and you want your system to be responsive, relevant, resilient, maintainable, and elastic. And I did not come up with these words myself. I will explain later on where they came from. Uh, so a little bit about myself, um, I'm a machine learning engineer at Zimmer Biomet, it's a medical devices company working in the orthopedics field. I am also a member of the scoping committee at Datakind UK. Uh, there was a brilliant talk this morning by Adam about the Brilliant Club, uh, which for whoever attended I think it was very, very interesting. Um, in my background, I have a social data science master's from the London School of Economics and Political Science and previous experience doing data science and machine learning in transportation, fintech, and the finance industries. And a little sec secret, up until a few months ago, I didn't know anything about event-driven systems, but as part of my work at Zimmer Environment, we are building a few event-driven components uh, so I got really intrigued by that subject and I investigated it and I decided it will be a nice topic to do a PyData talk on. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. So what's on the agenda? We'll do a short introduction. What is event-driven architecture in the software world in general? Uh, then we'll talk about what does it mean for it to be message-driven. We'll go through a few use cases in the, for machine learning. Uh, we'll talk about the serverless aspect and its benefits and disadvantages, a few common pitfalls and how to avoid them, and then finally we'll finish with a mini demo if everything runs smoothly, I hope so. Uh, so a disclaimer, I've never actually built a fully event-driven system myself. As I mentioned, I built components, so different components in our system are event-driven. Um, and as every other framework that you try to implement in this industry or in this world, it's dynamic, right? It's constantly evolving. Uh, whatever you're implementing today might be outdated in six months' time. Event-driven products will look differently across different platforms, different teams, different companies. It all depends on your limitations, your skills, your resources. And one very important point, it's definitely not suitable for every type of problem. So you need to think really, really hard if this is the right kind of solution for your problem. And more importantly, you should test it out um, before implementing it. So really, the, the goal for this talk is an introduction to the framework and an invitation <coughs> to how can the event-driven architecture help you in your next machine learning project. So hopefully, I've convinced you by now to join the dark side. Uh, I'm not sure about the cookies, but I promise the memes will get better. So what is event-driven architecture? It stands for EDA for short, and please don't confuse it with the other EDA we know from data science. And it is accurately described in the Reactive Manifesto. So the Reactive Manifesto is a document uh, that a few software developers have come together and they noticed this shift in the industry about how Different software developers are starting to build systems in a different way that is different from what they were used to. So they wanted to capture the concepts and the important bits of it in a document for other people to draw inspiration from. And I really recommend, if you really want to dive into this subject, then I recommend reading the document manifesto. It's not very long and it's an interesting read. And there is one quote there that I think captures um, the event-driven architecture, the essence of it. Um, so the quote is, application requirements have changed dramatically in recent years. Only a few years ago, a large application had tens of servers, seconds of response time, hours of offline maintenance, and gigabytes of data. Nowadays, users expect millisecond response times and 100% uptime. Data is measured in petabytes. Today's demands are simply not met by yesterday's software architectures, 
We want systems that are responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. We call these reactive systems. So this diagram is from that reactive manifesto, and it captures all of the traits that are part of an event-driven system in general. So the means, uh, how does it work? It's message-driven, and we're going to dive into what that means later on. Uh, but in essence, all the different communications and all of the basic, the basic backbone of the system it relies on messages that transfer in between all of these components. The form, it's elastic, meaning it contracts and it grows according to demand, which is very important. And it's resilient, meaning whenever we have problems, it will not just fail and it will handle those problems in a neat way. Finally, what value do we get from these kinds of systems? They are responsive, so meaning real time or close to real time. They are maintainable, they are extensible, and my addition for the machine learning context is that they are relevant. We want, for the machine learning use case, the models, for example, that we deploy to not be outdated, and we want to, for them to be uh, as accurate as possible in real time. And I will show in the demo uh, how we can achieve that with Python. Um, so let's talk about the backbone that I mentioned earlier, the messages. So in event-driven architecture, we have events, and those events trigger messages. And how does that work? So um, we're going to use message queues. So it's all built around message queues. And you might have heard of different open source systems for message queues. Um, the two of the most well-known ones are Apache Kafka and RabbitMQ. Um, some of you might have used it. Have anyone used Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ? Okay, cool. So you'll know what I'm talking about. But for those of you who don't know it, I really recommend a tutorial by a developer called Francesco Tissio. I think it was in PyData two years ago. Um, and he uses Python to explain uh, how does Apache Kafka work and how can you use it for your use case. And he uses a really nice example of a pizza place that does deliveries. He's an Italian guy. Uh, there's at least one comment there about pineapple on pizza, and he does not approve. I'll give you a spoiler. So a short description of how does Kafka actually work for those of you who don't know. Uh, for those of you who might know, this might be too simple, but um, very briefly. On one side, we have a message producer. So maybe it's a, an event that triggered a message and then the message producer push, pushes that message via an HTTP uh, protocol or something like that into an Apache Kafka cluster. And inside that cluster, we have the log of messages. And what the most important bit is that log of messages, it keeps the order, which is very important in an event-driven system. On the other side of the Apache Kafka cluster, there is a consumer basically pulling those messages from our cluster. And that's a very simple kind of like diagram representation. But in reality, you will have something closer to this, right? You would have multiple producers producing multiple messages. Sometimes they would be sending the same messages um, to different partitions within the same topic in Kafka cluster. So a topic is, it's easy to think about a topic as maybe a category of messages or a kind of messages. It's just a logical way to separate the different messages coming in and out of your cluster. Inside each topic, you might have multiple partitions. It's a way to distribute uh, the messages if you want uh, to back up and not lose some of them. Or if you want to have multiple consumers consuming the same messages. Um, so this is how it would look like in real life. Basically, it will look like this, Harry Potter trying to fish out for um, letters. Another very important uh, piece of resource that we would use in an event-driven system um, is a function as a service, F-A-A-S for short. So it's a cloud resource that basically decouples all of the infrastructure from the logic, right? If you're using a function as a service, you won't, you won't have to worry about uh, load or latency or all of that because all of that is being handled by whoever is providing that function and I'll talk about 
how we can achieve that. Uh, essentially, it's a serverless framework, right? So, and as a serverless framework, it achieves the responsiveness and elasticity requirements of our event-driven system. So there are commercial and there are open source uh, solutions. You probably heard of, about AWS Lambda, uh, which is, I guess, the most popular kind of uh, commercial offering. And there's also Azure functions and uh, GCP functions that achieve the same thing. Um, you, docker, you usually would dockerize some kind of Docker image and then you would serve it to that, um, to that function and it would listen for maybe HTTP requests and then once it gets triggered, it does something. That's a very general description of how it works. But not only you can achieve that with commercial offerings, you can also do the same with an open source solution. So if you have a Kubernetes cluster that you're running in production, on top of it, you can use open source projects to achieve the same thing. And those projects, what they do is that they <coughs> utilize the scalability property of a Kubernetes cluster for the same, to achieve the same goal, right? So whenever we have a lot of requests coming in, it will grow, it will use more nodes, it will use more compute, and whenever there is less, it will contract and use less resources. So to name a few of these projects, uh, there is Knative, which my team actually tested out and we've really liked it. Uh, there's also Apache OpenWhisk and there's a project called Fission. So before we dive in into the use cases, let's take a look at how the standard machine learning system usually looks like. And then we can compare the use cases to the standard system so we can see what are the differences and how can we use the benefits of an event-driven system. So in the standard machine learning system, and this is a very simple representation, right? It will probably be more complicated in reality, and it will probably have its own kind of quirks and special requirements and so on, but it just for our, for our purpose here, it's, it's simple enough to understand. So you would have uh, users using an application on their phone, and in that application, they're generating data, right? By using it, maybe filling out forms, maybe playing a game, whatever it is, that data would be sent to a data ingestion service. <coughs> that data ingestion service would probably batch up all of that data coming in and do some processing on top of it, not any kind of manipulation or any changing or aggregation of the data, uh, but just very, sim very simply sending it to a relational database to be stored. And that would be our production database. Usually SQL database, sometimes NoSQL, uh, all different sorts, but that is uh, usually what you have. On top of that relational database, what usually happens is that you have an ETL pipeline. It would often run on schedule. It might be like an Apache Airflow DAG or an Argo, uh, similar thing with Argo. It would run on schedule maybe hourly, maybe daily, maybe weekly to consume all of that data or all the new data that came into the relational database, aggregate it, manipulate it, so that it can be put into a data warehouse where in that data warehouse, it would be stored in a way that is more purpose towards analytics and machine learning, right? Um, so from that data warehouse, uh, analysts, data scientists would use it for their analytics purposes and also to build machine learning models. So we would have a machine learning training pipeline. Um, if you're using um, Azure, it would be like the Azure machine learning workspace. Um, and if you're using AWS, it would be, uh, yeah, that. Uh, so then in this training pipeline, it can also be uh, an open source uh, like MLflow. You would also have it running on schedule probably maybe once every 24 hours, maybe once a week. And it will take in the data from the data warehouse, package it up uh, and run the training essentially, package it up into a model, it might be a pickle file, it might be an Onyx file, and deliver it into an ML model service that runs in our production and basically does inference, right? So how does it do inference? In this case, it taking in batches from our relational database. Um, again, running on schedule, depending on our requirements, maybe hourly, maybe weekly, maybe daily, and 
serving those, um, those uh, predictions or classifications, whatever it is, back to the users. So you can see how this kind of process can be really slow and cumbersome, right? From the time that data is coming in to, uh, to our databases and up until it is actually used for training a machine learning model might take a lot of time. Also, when we want to generate predictions or classifications using uh, data that is generated now by our users, it might also take time with this batch inference kind of system until they get those responses back. So first uh, use case that we can use an event-driven system is for real-time inference. And there was a really nice talk this morning by Theodore from Get Your Guide, which basically showed a real implementation of this. Um, it, it looked a little bit different. He didn't use uh, function as a service. I'm um, not sure about message queues, but the general idea was very similar, right? So if before we had the machine learning model pulling batches of data from our production database and running that inference on top of it, what we have in this case in the event-driven system is that whenever data is generated by users, it will first of all go to the message queue and from that message queue, it would have two consumers. So the first consumer is data ingestion process, uh, which is, as before, doing the same thing. We might still need it for our other production systems or services running. Um, but it will also go straight to the machine learning model inference function as a service. And this reduces the latency between when data is generated to when the inference happens dramatically, right? It can be even milliseconds if you build it the right way. Um, so that's it. I, I'm using the cursor <laughs> to point to the different parts of the diagram just so that the recording will see this and everyone else will see this. I hope that you can all uh, see the cursor. So another use case for uh, an event-driven system is something that is called online or continual or incremental learning. I've heard at least these three names. I think I've also seen someone use streaming learning. So you know how usually if we compare it to the standard system, when, from when data came into our system until our model actually learned from it can take a long time, right? We would have to wait for the ETL pipeline to run and then we would have to wait for the machine learning training pipeline to run. And that could take maybe even months sometimes until we have that data uh, fed into our model. But if we implement online learning, we can minimize that data to sometimes even seconds, right? So as before, we're going to use a message queue that takes in the data that the users are generating on their phones. And from that message queue, we're going to have two streams going into two different uh, destinations. So first of all, we're going to have the non-labeled data where we don't have the labels. Uh, as before, going to our inference machine learning model function as a service. But we might also have labeled data. Let's say we are prompting our users to tag their own data. Uh, some of them might uh, comply, might be generous enough to spend time tagging for us. And we have and then we have these data points, really nice data points that are tagged by your users. So with that labeled data, we are sending it through the message queue into an uh, online machine learning model training function as a service. And I will show later on how that can be achieved with Python. So that function for online learning interacts with a model registry uh, that usually sits in your cloud. You might be using, again, MLflow for that. The only caveat here is that you might want the very first version of your model to be more, um, you want to scrutinize it more, right? So you want to have a deeper analysis of what goes on. So maybe for the first version, you might go for the standard classic way of putting it in a notebook, running a few different configurations, trying out all sorts of things to see uh, that the model really achieves what you're after. But then after you have the first version, there's 
really nothing that should stop you from just implementing the online learning where your model is continuously learning from new data uh, all the time. So a few uh, more points about online learning. It's very, very useful where you have big data sets, where your full data set training can be very expensive. You can think about a uh, data set which is petabytes large, and every time you would run machine learning training pipeline on that kind of data, it might take, I don't know, even uh, thousands of dollars just to train it for one time. So if you incrementally add data points as you go and you train it that way, you can, uh, it's much more efficient and you can save a lot of costs. Another very, uh, a very big benefit is that it helps you avoid uh, concept drift. So if there is, there is this term of concept drift that means that essentially the relationship between your target variable and your, feature, your features changes over time. And if you're running this, um, the training of the model in batches or there is a, a very big lag between when you're getting the data to when it is actually being served, then and, the, and then that, that relationship between the target variables and features changes, then your model will be biased. And this kind of like online learning method helps you avoid that. Uh, so we have, I've made these two animations here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the slides that show uh, how does it actually look like for a linear regression model. I just put it up on a linear regression model just to show a very simple kind of like use case. So in the very first animation on the top here, we see points being added uh, constantly over time. And as more points are added, our model is more accurate, there's less bias, our performance metrics go up, right? So that's very simple and easy. But what happens if at some point, the relationship between your features and your target variable changes, right? So in the linear regression model, you can think of it as the coefficient changes over time. And this is the animation in the bottom of the slide here, where it's forced, at first we get these nice red points, and the model has uh, uh, some coefficient, but then at some point the relationship between the features and the target variable changes, and these are the green points here, and we can see that our line here, the linear regression line, just slowly skews towards it over time. You can also set a cutoff, so for example, if you have this kind of like system in production, you would say, don't look at any da data points before um, that are more than a month ago or more than a week ago, depending on, a, on your use case. And how can you achieve that in Python? So if you're using sklearn, there's a really nice method that is called partial fit. And with partial fit, you can take your existing sklearn model and feed it with new data points, so new x's and y's, and it will just train on those new data points using the parameters from before. Um, according to the documentation, if you have an original data set and you have a new data set, using partial fit would be conceptually identical to training on the whole data set, so the new and the old. Um, it, does, it, it isn't available for all SQLearn models, um, but there is a list of, of those, that, uh, those models that it is relevant for on the sklearn uh, documentation. There's also a really nice open source project for online machine learning. It's called River. Uh, I highly recommend trying it out. In the demo that I'm going to show later, I've implemented uh, linear regression with River uh, for a very, very complex, simple representation, but it has at least, I saw at least 40 different models that you can implement online machine learning for. Uh, so a few words about serverless. And you, you might be tempted to think that serverless is the answer to all of your problems, uh, but people tend to forget there is actually a server under the hood. It's just sometimes it's not, um, it's not a, open to you or you can't reach it, right? So it's handled by AWS or whoever is handling your, your serverless application. Um, but what is definitely true is that it saves you time and effort. So if you're using a serverless application, you don't have to worry about like 
configuring the infrastructure and the resources and so on. But from what my team has seen and what the Amazon Prime Video team has seen also is that it probably does not save you money. So there is a really nice article by the Amazon Prime Video team uh, they've published recently where they basically ditched all of their AWS serverless uh, applications and decided to go for a monolith architecture and by doing that they were able to save 80% of their costs. Uh, I was really surprised to see that the Amazon Prime Video team published that, but I guess it's just money coming out, in and out of Jeff Bezos' pocket, so he doesn't care. <laughs> All right, uh, so a few common pitfalls and how to avoid them. From what my team has experienced so far, and from what I've seen people implementing uh, EDA doing. Um, so data loss, uh, which is obviously a very, very big risk. In your message queues, it's very recommended to allow long retention periods. So let's say you have an Apache Kafka cluster, you can set a retention period, which means for how long the data coming into the Kafka cluster will be uh, kept. And after that period of time, it will be deleted. Uh, so for example, you can set it for seven days or a month. Uh, Obviously, the longer the better, but you need to think about costs as well. Wherever you have idle data in your system, you should back it up always, but that's a general recommendation. It's not necessarily uh, very important for EDA specifically. Uh, it's also very important to simulate services breaking uh, in your system. There is a package by the Netflix uh, software team which is called Chaos Monkey. You probably heard of it, where it simulates uh, services breaking in your system and basically tests the resilience of your system. Wherever you have bad data coming into your system, it doesn't fit the schema. You don't want your system to break, obviously, but you also don't want to leave that data behind. You want to isolate it, investigate why it is bad, what happened wrong, uh, and then solve the issue. Uh, another very uh, useful thing to do is use the Delta Lake benefit. There was a talk uh, yesterday by uh, a guy from Databricks uh, doing a tutorial on De Delta Lake. The nice thing about the Delta Lake framework is that it keeps the log of the changes across time of what happens to your data. So let's say something went wrong in your event-driven system. You can basically go back in time to the point where everything was right and fix it from there. Uh, versioning, so you might have different versions for schema, models, components, tools, and systems in your system. And ideally, you would want all of them to be aligned across all of the different components. Obviously, that's hard if you have a very complicated system, uh, but that should be covered by, by tests, hopefully, if your tests are good. Another thing you can do is use the Avro file format for saving data. And what's useful about that <coughs> is that it tracks schema changes across time. And if you're tracking the schema changes across time, you can, again, go back to the point where everything was working and work your way from there. And I think the biggest risk in the event-driven system is congestion. Because we're using message queues everywhere, imagine it's like a supply chain and where one service is breaking, you might have a congestion in one message queue in one message queue because that service broke. So the way to solve that risk is that you can write representative stress tests. By representative, I mean you should really aim for those stress tests to be uh, representable of what could happen in your production setting. So if it means that you would have many more users, then that that that's your stress test. If it means that those same users might be sending much more data, then that's your stress test. So try to mimic what would happen in production. Identify slow processes. So in your system, you would probably have some processes that are slower than others. Identify them, see how can you make them quicker because if something might go wrong, that's where usually it will go wrong. Um, break down to microservices. So Wherever you can, every service that you have, break it down to smaller and smaller and smaller parts. 
And what that helps you achieve is, first of all, if you have potential bugs, that will help you uh, identify them. And it will also um, isolate dependencies. So a thing that can go wrong in these kinds of systems is that when you have, let's say, one service that is dependent on multiple other services behind it to work, then if you break those down into microservices, that will give you this asynchronous kind of uh, stream in your, in your system. And now uh, time for a mini demo, or as my man Omar would say, a man gotta have a coat. <laughs> and hopefully it will work because there are a lot of moving parts in here. Right, so I've made this uh, Streamlit application. Uh, is anyone doing a demo in this conference, right? Uh, so this Streamlit application interacts with a local Kubernetes cluster. Inside my local Kubernetes cluster, I have a Kafka message queuing system. And I also have a fast API river model training service. And I will dive into the code of how it looks like uh, in a bit. This service and the Streamlit application interact with my local file storage. Uh, so it's writing the data and the model and these plots you'll see into my local file storage. So whenever we'll start getting messages, we'll see them here and we'll see the examples. Uh, once the model is trained, we will see the model's beta, the coefficient in here, and the mean absolute error here. Uh, and in this part, we're going to generate the data. So we're following the basic uh, linear regression model, so the linear model. We have the y's and the x's, the beta for coefficient, epsilon for error. The epsilon follows a normal distribution with a mean of zero and the standard deviation. And here you can choose different parameters uh, for generating this synthetic data, right? So we're choosing a beta of one, 20 data points, standard deviation of 0 0.1. We're generating the data set and we'll see that Kafka has started receiving messages. So you will see the, the message, this is an example of the messages coming in in Kafka. And this is a plot of the online linear regression after our river model has trained. We will see that the beta is 0 0.13. Uh, the mean absolute error is 0 0.44, so not very good. But as we keep generating and getting more data into our model, it will obviously, or hopefully, get better, right? So this might seem slow, the slow part here is actually the reading and writing to the disk. The river model, uh, I've tested it many times locally in notebooks and so on, is very, very fast. Uh, so that's at least from my experimentation, right? So we've added more data points to our model and now um, the coefficient is hopefully closer to what it really is, should be. And our mean absolute error has come down, which is better. But what happens if we have a concept drift, like I've, I've mentioned earlier? So for some reason, our coefficient, our beta, has changed, right? And in reality, this can happen too uh, for our model, wherever we're deploying it. The relationship or between our features and our target variable changes. So at first, what happens, it's probably, it's not very nice, right? We have a biased model. Um, our model doesn't fit very well with our data, right? Because we have this kind of, this coefficient at first, and then the relationship changes and it looks like this. But over time, if we're getting more and more data, so let's say we're getting 200 more points, right? So hopefully after we're getting much more data, we have our model will be less biased because it learned much more from the new data and it the, the the older data is negligible and as i mentioned before you might also say there's a cutoff period for not even taking any data points which are older than a week for example and as we can see here our model is still a little bit biased but it's in a much better better position and looks better so let's take a sneak peek at the code to see how it looks like. 
so this is my Streamlit app. Uh, all of these are headers and pictures, not very interesting. But when we're generating a data set, uh, this is how it looks like um, using the standard kind of like random fun Python functions. And then once we have that generated data set, we're sending it to Kafka. And to do that, we're using a Kafka producer. So there is a Kafka official package for Python. And with that Kafka producer, we're telling it which server to go to uh, and how to send that data. So once we've sent that data to Kafka, we're also consuming it. So at the same way we have a Kafka producer, we also have a Kafka consumer. And again, we're telling it which server to listen to uh, and which topic. And now we can take a look at the, uh, the app itself, so the training app. So that's a standard face fast API app, nothing very innovative and interesting here. But if we look at the river model, you will see that um, it's just a linear model, kind of like module, which has a linear regression class. And we also have a metrics uh, module with an MAE class. And what happens is that for each new data point coming in, uh, we have these methods. So let's start from the bottom up. So we have a method called learn one, meaning for each new data point coming in, use that to update the model. And in the same way we have a learn one, we also have a learn many. So let's say you have multiple data points coming in, this streaming kind of like um, training of our machine learning happens can happen for one data point or for many. And we also have a predict one method, which just takes in one X point and predicts what would be the Y for that. Uh, and we also have the update uh, method for the metric, uh, which updates our mean absolute error across time whenever we're getting, whenever we're running it uh, on the true Y and our predicted one. So then, yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of the code. And yeah, I think now is a good time for questions if you have any. Um, yeah, we can get the microphone to whoever has questions. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I was just curious, I can see it's like a linear regression model being trained on. Um, I was thinking, does this also scale towards deep learning models, which I would imagine will take a bit longer to train and probably need more data points to not overfit? Does this also scale to such models? That's a good question. I haven't tested it. Uh, but I recommend going on the river, uh, on the river project page and looking at their different models list and seeing uh, if it's on there. It's a good question. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. And I'm also happy you brought up the um, concern in the BS published earlier. Um, my question just was that because like the only thing in the BS put out was regarding costs, which is important. But when you're thinking about monolith and microservice architecture in this context, what is your thought process on which of the, I would say, like, architecture to use? Like, what is your, let me say, thought process or decision if you had to go with one of them and why? Yeah. Um, so I would say that with the monolith, so doing, doing, using a monolith architecture today, I think, would be very brave. <laughs> Not a lot of uh, teams would choose that as a go-to architecture, uh, just because if something goes wrong in your server, then everything is wrong, right? Then it's, if you have it distributed across multiple servers or multiple services, at least you can isolate the problem. So I would say if I would have to build something from scratch today, I would go for different services or microservices. Um, just because you can isolate the problems easily. Um, 
but at the same time, I would be interested to test out a monolith architecture, just because seeing the Amazon Prime Video team had such a good success with it, so maybe it's worth trying out. Yeah, I just like going to dig to dig deep into that. Do you think in your own use case, apart from the cost that Amazon pointed out, do you think that some other cases that you feel like maybe monolith will like let me see the context, not looking at cost of finance? Um, I think actually there is uh, an element of optimization exercise you can do. So if you have, we did it as a, in our team actually, if you try to, let's say, list all of the different service, the servers or computes that you can get on your cloud provider, and then you put even in an Excel spreadsheet all of the different costs by days, times, and so on, uh, you can do a very simple optimization exercise and see what is the combination of computes according to memory, CPU usage, and all of that, which is best for your use case. And we did that kind of exercise, and weirdly enough, what we got that for our use case is that the most optimal, in terms of costs, the most optimal solution would be to use a monolith. So I think it's something worth trying out. Yeah. Apologies, but time is okay. for the next session. Thank okay. you. Thank you.